The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency uh, Terence Michael Drew, uh, Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, National Security and Immigration, Health and Social Security of St Kitts and Nevis. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. I have the great pleasure in uh, welcoming His Excellency Terence Michael Drew, Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, National Security and Immigration, Health and Social Security of St Kitts and Nevis. I invite him to address the Assembly. Mr President, Mr Secretary General, distinguished delegates, I congratulate you on your elections as the President of the General Assembly of this August body. I also pause to salute your predecessor in office, His Excellency Abdullah Shahid, the Foreign Minister of Maldives, for his sterling tenure during his service. I recognize the Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, for his outstanding stewardship over the past few years. Mr. President, it is indeed an honor for me to address this body for the first time since assuming the role of Prime Minister just 44 days ago. I therefore bring you greetings from the government and people of St. Kitts and Nevis and we pledge our unserving support to the ethos of this great body. I have assumed my new responsibilities when the complexities of the multiple and interlocking challenges facing humanity that require from us a renewed commitment to the democratic principle and multilateralism. It is clear to me that the tectonic plates of geopolitics and global stability are shifting beneath us. What are those tectonic shifts? It is now certain that medical knowledge, that knowledge, that a pathogen can emerge with lethal power that it threatens the very survival of mankind. The coincidence in timing of a global pandemic and a war with growing calamity of the climate crisis has exposed the fragility, vulnerability, and instability of the global supply chain, chains of food, staples, and other essentials. Power shifts are taking place in international relations as the influence of some countries rises and others wanes. With this has come an insistence for reform to the United Nations to make it more relevant and reflective of the composition of today's world and current power structures, including reform of the anachronistic Security Council. The effect and widespread nature of technology is creating change faster than most can manage. Faith in multilateral systems is being eroded, and its, a capac its capacity to do global good is being jeopardized by the rising crass, unbridled nationalism, which has shown the powerful to be nonchalant to the suffering of anyone other than their own population. It was the seventh Secretary General, His Excellency Kofi Annan, who reminded us that no nation can defend itself against threats to development entirely on its own, that the challenges we face are global, and they demand a global response. This remains true today. COVID-19, with all its consequences, has presented us with a powerful reminder that we are all connected, which compels every nation 
every person to be their brothers and sisters keepers. Mr. President, the United Nations finds itself at the crossroad in our reckoning with history's judgment. Do we want to be the body that abdicated our responsibility to protect the planet? Or the body that debates and postures as the world around us submerges beneath a cascading crisis? It is my hope that we choose instead to be the body that met the moment and responded to the fierce urgency of now. We must therefore use the 77th General Assembly not merely for political posturing, but for resolute recommitment to multilateral cooperation. For small island developing states and indeed vulnerable peoples everywhere, there can be no international security without climate security. This requires collective fidelity to multilateral action for our very survival. I am ready, and I am sure that all of us are eager to build a better world through multilateral action and uphold with all our will and might the sacred tenet of the United Nations. Every even as geopolitics and great power competition is exacerbating conflict and the climate catastrophe, we must face the hard truth that only through multilateralism will we face the global trajectory, will we force the global trajectory toward global peace, prosperity, and sustainability. Mr. President, every country on the planet, national populations have had to confront the reality of climate change. As our planet heats up, so too have the frustrations and impatience of the global's ordinary citizens who feel they are losing the fight to make ends meet and secure the future of their children. Small island developing states and other developing nations experience a reality plagued by this continuous existential threat. With the passage of every hurricane, every outbreak of war, and every global food shortage, we all remain at risk of tipping the balance that we have striven to create over these many, many years. Thus, it is not enough for us to articulate this grim reality year after year. We must now look to act in ways that provide tailored responses to these vulnerabilities as to foster true resilience and risk mitigation. Therefore, I humbly urge countries to honor the financial commitments made before the COP26 to double contribution to adaptation financing by 2025. A delayed response to these commitments, to these commitments would further imperil our developing nations. Climate financing, resiliency, and environmental conservation must be integrated into national development policies and must be at the forefront of our global development agenda. Mr. President, this situation cries out for the multilateral system to urgently put in place a multidimensional vulnerability index which takes into consideration the peculiar characteristics and climate vulnerabilities of small island developing states such as mine. Mr. President, all countries are environmentally vulnerable. All are socially and economically exposed to the exogenous shock. But in the climate challenge, tourism-dependent countries in the Caribbean Sea, during several consecutive months of every year, run the real risk of a wipeout event. Surely, this warrants special consideration. Caribbean nations are on the bullet end of a climate fight that we did not cause, do not want, and cannot afford, but we are unable to escape. I therefore join my brothers and sister leaders in CARICOM in calling for the development of a multi-dimensional vulnerability index, MVI. Therefore, 
St. Kitts and Nevis will use this index in its advocacy for a more appropriate redistribution of development assistance and access to concessional financing. Mr. President, notwithstanding this injustice, we continue to invest in social empowerment programs in order to build resilience in our people and our economy. One such area is education, which is one of society's greatest equalizer. St. Kitts and Nevis reaffirms that access to quality education is a human right and the foundation of sustainable development of thriving societies. We welcome the Transforming Educational Summit that was held earlier this week, and I'm happy to report that our government has committed to entering a new pact, a new deal on education, as it were, that will reform, transform, and reinvigorate our education system based on equality, access, and inclusion. In fact, just a few weeks ago, our government, my government, made a decision to introduce free tertiary education to ensure that all people can have equal access regardless of their socioeconomic status. Other goals for education reforms include, but are not limited to, one, incorporating STEAM specialist spaces in all schools. Two, reintroducing the iLiteracy one-to-one laptop program. And three, strengthening technical and vocational education by providing alternative programming and scholarships. Mr. President, as part of my government's thrust to mainstream empowerment across all sectors and policies, St. Kitts and Nevis will continue to put women and youth at the forefront of our social development and all our pursuits, including the advancement of the digital economy. We are confident our active inclusion of women and youth in public life through their appointment in our parliament, diplomatic and senior civil service and other decision-making fora will bear much fruit. Therefore, it is against this backdrop that we pledge our support to the ongoing process of the Declaration of Future Generation that will culminate in the summit of the future next year and pledge as its leader my country's active commitment to meeting goal five of the SDG and surpassing or meeting the goals of Belém de Pada in achieving gender equality now and for future generations. The recent past has proven that we cannot ignore the glaring truth of our interconnectedness as nations in the international community. The world continues to shrink in size, drawing us all nearer to each other, forcing the need for global solidarity, international cooperation, and strong and meaningful partnerships. We are stronger, therefore, in the company of our friends, particularly those who share our democratic principles and values, in this body of nations, I reemphasize our unserving support for Taiwan's meaningful participation in the UN system. Taiwan has been a long-standing friend and a partner for sustainable development. The unfailing commitment in this, the unfailing commitment in this regard since the very day of my country's independence is consistent with the spirit and intent of goal 17 of the Sustainable Development Goals. Mr. Sper Mr. President, I can also speak firsthand to what our friendship with the Republic of Cuba and what it means to me and its value to the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. Cuba has partnered with my own country and many in the developing world in healthcare education, training, and agriculture. We therefore called an end 
to the decades-long embargo imposed against Cuba. My country encourages meaningful dialogue in resolving these and other conflicts in countries that are targeted by unfair sanctions that create enduring external and internal hardships. Therefore, Mr. President, in closing, we must be bold and grand in the way we forge forward with a promise to leave no one behind. Our government, my government and I, are prepared to do our utmost for our people, which would be enhanced by multilateralism and the United Nations should therefore afford this opportunity to all of us. The theme for this year's General Assembly shares the idea of watershed, which speaks to the significant and transformational change that are take, changes that are taking place. The challenges faced by the countries of the world and their people, and indeed interlocking, and we must resolve them together. The issue for us is, how will we bring that change about for those who most need it? Mr. President, I am obliged. Thank you very much for this opportunity. On behalf of the Assembly, uh, I wish to thank the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, National Security and Immigration, Health and Social Security of St Kitts and Nevis uh, for the statement just made, and I thank uh, Protocol for escorting His Excellency.